Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to disaster recovery, business continuity, resilience, crisis management, anything that's relatable to those topics, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community plan for, prepare, and respond to and overcome adverse situations. If there is a topic you'd like us to talk about on the show, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free to go to my LinkedIn page. Uh, I am the only Alex Fullock on LinkedIn, so I'm really easy to find. Uh, just send me a message and uh, we'll, uh, I'll get in touch with you and we'll see about getting you on the show or finding someone else to come on the show and talk about what you'd like us to touch on. Longtime listeners and even new watchers now on YouTube uh, and Voice America, you'll know that for quite some time I talked about the BCI Virtual World Conference in 2020 that I was speaking and that I hope to be able to get some of those speakers. By now you probably know I was able to get quite a few of those speakers, uh, which is great, uh, sharing lots of new information and uh, new insights. I'm quite happy with that. Today is no different. There was a panel discussion, how to be an ally, and I'd like to welcome to the show today one of those panelists, Lucille Kamar. Lucille, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Really delighted to be here. Now, we've got uh, literally listeners and watchers around the globe. So can you take a minute or two and uh, talk about yourself, what you do? Yes, absolutely. So I'm currently working as a diversity and inclusion professional, and I know um, those are topics that are being discussed, especially over the, the last couple of months, but really for years. So it's been a really interesting time um, to be able to exchange with people on that. Um, but with regards to my personal background and, and my interest, um, I grew up in a mixed race family in France. Um, so French and Arab. So I've had a really interesting upbringing, but also very interesting um, realization of, of my own privilege, uh, which I'm hoping that's, that is something that we can talk about later on in the show. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you get involved with BCI? Um, I, I was uh, contacted by one of the organizers um, who rightly pointed out the correlation between diversity and inclusion and resilience, whether it's for uh, organi organizational resilience or individual resilience. Um, and also because I think there was a need at the time to people wanting to act, uh, be able to uh, drive diversity and inclusion, but not really knowing where to start, which is where this allies piece come, come in, comes in. Okay, now you I mentioned the topic of the panel that you were on how to be an ally. First of all, what do you mean by an ally? And then we'll get into characteristics after us, but what is an ally? It, it sounds like, you know, you know, you're here in politics, right? You have allies and adversaries. So what, what is an ally? Yeah, uh, and I, I really like that we start by defining, defining what it means. Um, but really an ally is someone who um, either due to their privilege or their position is able to act um, on behalf and is interested in knowing more um, about a group of people or individuals that are different from, from who they are. Um, so we talk about, um, when we talk about allies, it can be uh, an ally to the LGBT plus community or um, men allies to gender equality or um, how to move from being an ally to anti-racist, which is again, uh, a distinction that we've um, talked about for, for a while. Um, but simply speaking, you can be an ally if you're organizing a virtual meeting to make sure that it's accessible, that you're having subtitles, for example, or um, you have text which is um, able to be read uh, by, um, by someone who might have a hearing disability or, um, that you have um, text that can be um, made bigger, so it can be it can cover any of um, of diversity characteristics that that make us who we are. Really, uh, that's very different than what I was thinking. You might say, to be honest, because oh, I, I didn't, I hadn't heard the term ally and what it really uh, meant. So the way you explained it is very different than what I thought. You know, um, you which is interesting. I, you know, I like that. <laughs> Well, what was your understanding of allies? Well, when, when you read it, and I, I guess maybe it's because of the media, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not blaming media at all, because the only time you re ever really hear that term is, you know, people that are your friends, and that's it. 
you know, and, and do what you do really that, you know, when it comes to, you know, UK and Canada or, you know, US and, you know, uh, Japan, you know, a different, they, they're, they're friends, not, you know, international friends uh, who are always on side with what you do. You know, that's really the definition. I think most people hear, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to allies. So hearing your yours was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it, it's like uh, someone on the opposite spectrum actually supporting you and helping you. Yeah, that's right. And and I think, you know, you can be passive if you're if you're an ally, i.e., you know, not being uh, sexist or homophobic. But I think what we mean with allies is really taking that active step into mm. driving change, um, which I suspect is not that different from the ally as we tend to think of it. You know, you're watching out for other people's, your ally's interests as well as your own. Yeah. So what are some of the characteristics of, of being an ally? You know, and uh, you kind of touched on some of the examples, but, but can you go a little bit more into that? You know, because it's easy for me, I could sit here and say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I support X, Y, and Z, you know, that's fine. But am I really an ally? Yeah, and I think that's what uh, is really interesting about it. Um, and I do believe that anyone can be an ally um, as long as they're willing to listen first and foremost. Uh, and do the work as well. When we talk about allies, it's um, you know not about being passive and saying, well, you know, I'm not racist or I'm not homophobic, therefore I'm an ally. But it's really how do you take that step further? What are you doing to educate yourself and learn about the issues facing uh, communities that are different that, than your own? And uh, once you've done that education piece, when you've done the listening exercise, what can you put in place? Um, what resources do you have, um, which might be um, resources such as power, such as time, such as influence, such as a, a media platform to um, drive a message that other people who might not have those resources um, and therefore might not be too able to, to put out there. And I think that's why it becomes really interesting for all of us um, you know, regardless of where we are in our careers journeys or in organizations, we can all do something active that really drives equality forward. Is it, um, you know, I, I might be treading on el- eggshells here, but is it okay to ask questions for clarity? Because, um, you know, I, I've been in a couple of situations myself where, you know, I, I want to understand something, a topic, you know, because um, maybe I was brought up with a different idea or I've just never been involved with a certain um, uh, culture or I've never met someone from, you know, X, Y, Z and I have no idea, you know, so I ask a question, but sometimes um, you get negative feedback. You know, it's like, well, you should know better. It's like, well, no, I don't know better. And I'm reaching out, you know, I'm reaching out to know better you know, help me understand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that happens, you know, and and I'm trying to be an ally, but yet, you know, and and I'm not the only person that experiences this too. It happens everywhere in every culture, you know. Um, How do you address those kind of things? Mm, Yeah, and that's a really great question because we can't know everything about everyone, but what matters is that we're willing to to do the work. So starting questions and and actually realizing that we don't know uh, and that we shouldn't make assumptions on on other people is a really great way to start. Um, And I think most people would prefer um, you asking questions such as how do you pronounce name and and why it's important uh, to actually pronounce someone's name in the right way. What pronouns do they use? Do they identify as he or she or they, them? Um, And by asking those questions, you make it okay for those people to to know that it's safe uh, for them to either come out to you or to be their true selves. So I think asking question uh, is a really good way. You know, it shows humility. It shows that you're ready to do the work. Um, But also there is a lot of... um, you have to watch out for emotional labor. Um, and that's particularly what, relevant. What, what's emotional labor? So for example, in, in the context of um, Black Lives Matters, um, a lot of um, our black colleagues and friends have been asked to, um, to talk about their experiences of being black in the workplace when actually, you know, why are they doing this work uh, when there is so much available? There are so many other blogs um, 
that are available talking about people's experiences. So emotional labor is basically work that you do um, that is not part of your work, but it still is taxing in the way that you might be relieving some trauma. And that's not just for um, our black colleagues and friends. Um, it can be if you're talking about domestic abuse in, in the workplace, asking someone to talk about their experiences, which might, might be uncomfortable of, of tax or taxing. Um, for them. But I think, you know, talking about being comfortable when you're learning and when you're growing, um, there is this element of, of discomfort, discomfort of not, or not knowing or, or imagining that you might say or do the right thing. Um, and, and that's scary. And some people will just say, well, I just don't know. Therefore, no, it's safer if I don't ask or if I don't do anything. But by, you know, hiding, by being passive, that's how we let um injustice injustices carry on so mm -hmm. what asking question is great uh, but first and and really important in terms of validating people's um, identities and feelings and experiences um, but also can you do the work first you know is this something that you can google uh, and read about and then you can ask follow-up questions but also making sure that that person is in the right place to to answer those questions and, and I guess by looking at Google too, you know, uh, I would learn, hopefully, the right way to ask a question, not something insensitive, you know, and that can come across as not being an ally right off the bat. Yeah, that's right. And a good way of putting it is, would I ask myself this question? Is it appropriate mm, yeah. to ask this person um, this question? And, you know, sometimes it's just not inappropriate and you know, is, is this just curiosity or is it something that you really want to do? You really want to act positively once you receive that information. So always think, would I ask, how would I feel if someone, someone else asked me this question? Yeah. Is it appropriate? Would I feel uncomfortable disclosing or talking about this aspect of my personal life? And would also being part of an ally uh, also relate to standing up when someone is being, um, I'll say insensitive, you know, and, and you know, mm -hmm. um, maybe spouting off stereotypes or something, you know, that isn't positive, you know, say, like, hey, 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 you know, don't talk to this person like that. This is what you're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and again, that's a really good point because it comes from you know that notion of of privilege, which is when we talk about privilege, it's not that your life hasn't been hard, it's not that you've um ha you haven't had any struggles, it's just like you've benefited from a system that favors um, characteristics that you have, so it might be privilege around um, your ethnicity, um, privilege around your education around your social economic background, um, around your gender uh, as well. And, and sometimes you might have access to, um, to the decision makers that other people might not have. Or if you witness um, something that shouldn't, be, that shouldn't happen, then absolutely you can step in um, and, and say something. And it might not be, um, you might decide not to do that right when this is happening sometimes you might want to talk to this person after after the act but you might also want to check in with the person who was at the receiving end of what was said or, or done um but yeah absolutely it's um it's what we call micro affirmation which are the opposite of microaggressions that you and your listeners might be already aware of and you touched on an interesting point there talking to the the person on the receiving end you know um uh, if by chance, you know, you don't say anything when there is some sort of a confrontation, I guess talking to that person saying, you know, uh, how can I help you? You know, what is it? You know, I'm not sure what I should say, you know, how mm -hmm. I should step in. Even though I know that the aggressor was wrong, I just, I don't know how to address that situation properly. And that's got to be tough for people too. Yeah, it would be. And, um, you know, other people will prefer other um, types of, of reactions. But, you know, checking in and, and saying, I noticed this happened. Are you OK? Um, mm. Is there anything that I can do? Um, so then, you know, you're not putting yourself as, as the savior. You are doing it as the other person. You're not doing it um, for what we call performative allyship, um, which is something that is quite interesting. It's when you're 
doing an act um, of, of an ally, but expecting a pat on the back. You're doing it to make yourself feel better as opposed mm. to actually changing the situation. So, you know, this is this element of showcasing the good that you're doing when actually, you know, first and foremost, it should be centered around the person um, who um, might be either in the minority or at the receiving end or of a comment or an act. You, you mentioned um, uh, about equality, you know, between the sexes. Mm -hmm. And I've always uh, had an issue, uh, and I still do to this day, with anyone who says, you know, um, female uh, executives are this way and male executives are that way, you know, and who's, who's most powerful. And I always get really upset, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I have a much stronger word for that. Mm -hmm. But I get really upset because I grew up in a single parent home for the most part. So I had my mom and my mom's two best friends, you know, who sadly no longer with us, um, Kendall and Brenda, I was surrounded by powerful women, you know, and to me and what they all went through, you know, um, uh, they suffered with cancer and diabetes mm -hmm. and things like that. My mom has health issues, you know, and yet still kept going. And I found growing up in their homes that I was surrounded by more powerful women than anyone else. So when I hear someone say anything along that, I get really, no, <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> you know, my experience is not that men are this way and women are that way. You know, I, I was surrounded by powerful women. Does that make me uh, an ally in some respect? Uh, no, I'm, I'm really asking honestly, you know, because when anytime I do hear something like that, I really stand up and speak something, you know, and I say, speak my mind going, no you're wrong. I don't want to hear that kind of thing. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And being an ally is also about challenging expectation, um, expectations and assumptions and really stepping up when uh, you hear something that you're, you know um, is not right with regards to, um, to equality and, and justice as well. Um, but I think what's really interesting is, is about the expected behaviors and the gender roles that really uh, holds um, women and, and men back. Um, and I think when it becomes also interesting is looking at, you know, the breadth of, of genders beyond men and women. Um, but I think, you know, gender stereotypes are also detrimental to, to men um, in the fact that, um, you know, with the mental health for men, for example, and in the UK, uh, men are a lot more um, or are victims or commit suicide at, at a much higher rate um, than, than women. And, and, you know, the fact that they don't feel able to, to talk about that mental health is also detrimental. And my last point is really around, you know, leadership skills that you were mentioning. And, and I think right now we're, you know, moving towards a new era of what makes a good leader. And we're seeing skills such as um, authenticity and vulnerability and curiosity that are more and more important. And, you know, that's something that employees and customers and shareholders expect a lot more from, uh, from leaders and from organizations, you know, knowing that it's not enough to put a mm -hmm. statement on your website or on your social media, what are you actually doing that has an impact on the lives of the people working for you and with you, but also your customers and, and the rest of the population? Yeah, saying and doing are two different things. That's right, yeah. My next question is, uh, how do we build DNI into resilience programs? Now, can you explain what DNI is, first of all, and then we can move into how we incorporate that into our programs? Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, those at DNI, diversity and inclusion are terms that a lot of people are talking about, but we're not quite sure yet what it means. Uh, mm -hmm. And everyone wants to be involved, but unless you're able to, you know, go back to the origins of the, the words and the semantics, you might miss out on the, uh, on the subtleties of the, world, the words. So diversity is simply put, everything that makes us unique, um, all our characteristics, whether they are visible or invisible. So visible characteristics could be um, your um, gender, although, you know, careful not to make assumptions um, because you might be presenting in a gender, but identifying as another gender. Um, it can be your 
ethnicity, your age, if you have a visible um, disability as well. Now, invisible characteristics, um, it can be your, um, your sexual orientation, it can be if you have mental health issues, um, invisible disabilities, you might be a carer, uh, whether parents are caring for um, a, an elderly parent, um, you can um, your education background, uh, your social economic background. So um, I, I guess your your spiritual or uh, religious beliefs could fall into that as well. Right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and what's really interesting is that all of those identities intersect. Um, so intersectionality is a term also that people might not be familiar with, but but is also very important. And it was coined by um, Professor Crenshaw um, decades ago. And she was saying in the context of justice, uh, although now it's broadened a little bit, but it's really saying that your identity is made up of several layers um, of, uh, of characteristics. Um, you can't do anything about your diversity characteristics. You are who you are. Inclusion now is um, the active form. It's what are you doing to make people feel that they belong, that they're safe, um, that they can contribute to the best of their ability. So there's an active element to that. And that leads to, you know, th this idea of, of belonging uh, and psychological safety uh, in the workplace, which is quite important. Um, so psychological safety is is it safe in the workplace to voice your opinion? Can you talk about your ideas? Do you know that you can fail and not be blamed for it? Um, you know, can you talk about your, your family life? Can you talk about your mental health? Can you say that, you know, you don't have all the answers and not be shamed for it? And that's how the inclusion and that belonging element, um, uh, you know, take, takes place takes place, um, something that's quite uh, a good way of reminding yourself of what is diversity and inclusion is saying, diversity is inviting everyone to the party, um, inclusion is making sure that everyone's dancing and belonging is um, ensuring that everyone's having fun. So how can you get that um, DNI, diversity and inclusion, uh, to become part of a organizational resilience program? Yeah. You know, or, or I don't even want to say program, but how do you incorporate that into an organization to help the organization become more resilient? Yeah, and it's really interesting that you said program and then and then you said actually not a program because I really think that diversity and inclusion needs to be embedded throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that for several years, um, studies have shown that um, a lot of uh, Okay. The, more, the more diverse and inclusive organizations, the better they perform in terms of uh, financial results, return on investment, um, better attitude to risk and response to risk, um, you know, better creativity, problem solving, but also ensuring that um, organization remain relevant, remain fit for the future, are able to overcome challenges. Um, and that's how, you know, organizations can become more resilient when diversity and inclusion is being taken into consideration at, at all level. Um, you know, are you, is your recruitment process or promotion process indirectly um, discriminating against um, a certain group of people? And that's how you need to really unpick what, what, you're, what you're doing. Um, and I wanted to pick up on, you know, um, are you discriminating indirectly or unconsciously? Um, and I wanted to mention an example around unconscious bias that is quite quite famous. Um, it's about this this orchestra who was struggling that was struggling to attract women musicians. Um, so I, all the musician would come and audition, uh, but the numbers uh, were still quite low in terms of of women musicians. So what they did um, is that the the, uh, the the people auditioning put a screen. Um, and they just did blind auditions and they found that when they couldn't see the gender of the musicians, all of a sudden the gender diversity of the orchestra increased because they were not... Uh, oh, I lost well, you. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was just going to say I lost you there for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, but, but I was saying, you know, the screen was one thing, the blind audition was one, one thing, uh, but they were able still to hear 
or to guess unconsciously the gender of the musician based on how they were walking on the stage. So your brain makes decision or creates shortcuts based on information that you receive. And it might be uh, information that receive unconsciously such as things that you hear. Um, and that's why it's really important to be more conscious and be more aware of where our biases might lie. Um, and if you're interested in finding out what your biases are you know, for and against, um, there's a test called the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, which can be done and the, the results are confidential, but it, it really helps you identify you know, where you need to work and where you need to, to increase your awareness and you, your education. So if we, uh, and, and I think if I heard you correctly, we kind of all have some sort of unconscious bias, right? On, on, on some level. Mm -hmm. How can you address that in resilience programs? Or see, I keep using that word programs and you know, I, I, I am, I'm in agreement with you, you know, it's the entire organization, not a little group you know, of people working on it. Yeah. You know? yeah, exactly, not working in isolation. How do you incorporate or address that unconscious bias? You know, mm -hmm. if we all have it, we and we don't know it, then how do you address that? You know, I'm doing something I don't even know I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> that's, that's right. And and um, a safe a safe bet a safe place to start is to, as you said, uh, acknowledge that we all have unconscious biases that are different. So my biases, uh, my unconscious biases, will be different to your yours because they're based on um, our own experiences. You know how we grew up. Um, education system, etc. The the positive thing is that something can be done for unconscious biases. So first first thing is um, you know taking this test and understanding are you biased for or against a certain group of people. Um, and you know once you've acknowledged that, a good way to um, you know, that, that's why diverse teams are so important for resilient, resi to create resilient organizations, because by bringing that diversity of backgrounds, of ways of thinking, you're, um, you're able to, um, uh, to almost avoid that groupthink uh, that makes organizations so, so vulnerable to, to risk. Um, and, you know, there, there has been some studies uh, around the 2008 financial crash and showing that because there was such a group of people who had a similar background, who were thinking um, in a similar way, you know, their attitudes to risk was uh, completely off the charts, um, in, not in a good way. Uh, you know, there was nowhere to, no one to challenge their, um, their ways of thinking. And then, you know, that is a bias uh, in itself, group think, you know, the, um, the way that if other people think like me, then I must be right. What about um, uh, with resilience, you know, because you mentioned, you know, people being able to speak up, uh, you know, and, and uh, really be an active participant in meetings and, you know, decision making and things like that. What about um, when it comes to holidays? You know, we mm -hmm. have Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, Ramadan, you know, so many other different ones, you know, Diwali, you know, and um, my last contract, I worked at a bank where they kind of celebrated all of those. You know, and you know, I I felt it completely honored, you know, and a part of things myself when someone came along and said, you know, happy Diwali, and they left a, a, a candy or something on my desk, you know, or a treat they made. You know, it's like, wow, thanks for including me. You know, like it felt fantastic. Is that another way to help build that sort of sense? Mm, yeah, and again, picking up on, on what you said, you know, you felt honored. Oh, no, you said thanks for thank you for including me. Um, which is always really important, you know, including other people is a very conscious act. Um, but it can be, for example, you know, um, religious or cultural holidays is a good way to, um, to raising awareness, but also making sure that you don't assume someone's religion or, or heritage. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that you have that that discussion, um, but also talking about your your family. So um, your colleagues might be you know same sex um, partnership. Um, so you know not not asking also what does your husband or your uh, your girlfriend do um, or does, uh, but saying you know using partner um, is a good way to not um, assume um, someone's sexual orientation, and then it makes it safe for the other person to say well actually. I can be myself, I can talk about my family life. 
um, around around this person without you know fearing that they will treat me differently or you know start assuming something about about myself which is which might not be true. Does that mean you you mentioned uh, uh, the word assumption there? Yeah. Does that mean um, there's a link between making assumptions and our personal biases? Yeah. Um, so, so the way the way it works is that you've got your unconscious biases. Then you've got the second layer is when those um, those biases translate into thoughts. Um, so those are stereotypes and assumptions and judgments. And when it becomes problematic is uh, when those thoughts are translated into interaction. And that's really where you can target um, and and challenge your own biases to to prevent your your thoughts from from becoming actions that might be discriminatory, for example. In in the office place, then, based taking what you just said, you know, uh, we have assumptions, and you know, uh, mm. you know, uh, not that we should, but we have assumptions, and unfortunately, sometimes they come out, you know, uh, in a meeting or you know, some sort of workplace gathering. How do we address those situations? You know, do, do we let them play out and then yell and scream at someone later on? You know, you know, going back to what you said earlier, you know, uh, you know, addressing it and being an ally. How do we address when those kind of situations crop up then? Mm. And that's that's a really good um, that's a really good question, because different situation will call for um, a different response. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is appropriate to um, to actually stand up while the action is happening to prevent it from escalating and some other times it's it's more appropriate to um to address this, this situation in private it also depends whether you're you're comfortable doing that um, but also taking into consideration um you know what was the intent intent um of the the action or or the words although you know i would say that intent doesn't supersede the the impact you know you always have to be be mindful of what the impact of the words or the actions might be uh, but something with unconscious bias is that they're likely to occur in situations where you're lacking information or you have too much information or you're stressed, you're tired, you're hungry, uh, which is you know exactly what's happening right now with COVID. So we're a lot more vulnerable to unconscious biases um, in, in that context, which is why you know going back to um, individual resilience as well, it's important to look after your mental health and, and make sure that you always take a step back whenever possible. It's interesting you said that because uh, I'm recalling an incident many years ago where somebody was a, a little bit, um, how should I put this delicately, not quite as knowledgeable about a topic as they should have been. Mm -hmm. So they used a word in one way, but the word had kind of two meanings, if depending on how it was taken. And it was taken by the other person to be negative but it wasn't the way that person meant it. They were trying to, you know, communicate something and HR stepped in and said, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, you don't use that word, blah, blah, blah. And by stepping in to try and resolve the situation, it actually created a chasm. You know, it's like, well, I didn't know that this word means something else in that, you know, um, uh, in that uh to that person i'll just say mm -hmm. you know i have no way of knowing that you know it's just a, a word you know and hr turned around and you know, like i said you know pointed a finger no you're wrong you can't do that and it created a chasm how you know when, when that person didn't mean anything you know mm -hmm. anything negative at all how do you kind of try to bridge that gap and bring the, those people back together yeah, and I think it's about that constant education that uh, we have a responsibility to, to do, but organizations also have a responsibility to talk about, you know, why is it uh, is wrong to use uh, a term that might have been or might not have been okay 20 or 30 years ago, but why mm. right now you shouldn't use that word and the impact of using that word and, and what it might have. Um, and, and I really think creating that dialogue and diversity and inclusion is about that dialogue. It's about creating proximity between people. It's about creating uh, bridges and really looking at you. We might have more in common that what uh, makes us different. Um, so I think that's why, you know, it's not a program. It really needs to be embedded at all levels through comms, 
through recruitment process, through promotion processes. Um, and, and that's what makes it so, so fascinating and what makes it you know, such a, a continuous um, work in progress. Lots of great information, uh, Lucille, and I'm really enjoying this, uh, this chat. Um, probably because I've experienced some of this myself, you know, on both sides, you know, um, so uh, understanding uh, a lot of this is uh, really beneficial for me and I hope for many other uh, listeners and uh, viewers. Now, we talked about uh, organizational resilience and uh, diversity and inclusion. In an organization, who's actually responsible? Is there any one person responsible for DNI? Mm, and it's such a great question. Um, simply put, we're all responsible for driving diversity and inclusion because we, we all have interactions with people on a daily basis and each interaction is an opportunity to treat um, each other and treat everyone as, a, as an individual, which is um, you know, going back to not making assumptions, really treating everyone as individuals. Um, I really believe that we can all be leaders in, in one way or another in the way that we challenge um, situations that's, that might be um, that might not feel right. Um, so I touched on microaggressions and microaffirmations uh, earlier in the program. So microaggressions are um, they're like mosquito bites. You know, one is okay, but if you you have several you know dozens of mosquito bites in one day then it becomes uh, really unbearable. So that's a good way of thinking of, of microaggressions. You know, it can be anything from uh, mispronouncing the name, um, you know, using uh, the wrong gender, uh, not being uh, called in to speak in a meeting or having your um, having assumptions made about you repeatedly. It might be... Um, it, it, it might be having your ideas um, stolen from you repeated without giving you credit. Um, and that's where microaffirmation, you know, are simple things that, that we can all do, even if we're not the CEO, if we, if, even if we're don't, not responsible for a team, really to make sure that everyone feels including. So um, if, if you see that someone has, uh, is being given credit for someone else's idea, just saying, well, I think that this person said that before, uh, and I thought that was a really great idea. Um, it might be asking a person, what are your pronouns? My pronouns are she and her, what are yours? Can I check how I pronounce your name? You know, using, um, you know, what's your, um, do you have a partner as opposed to um, a boyfriend or girlfriend? Um, but, but also I think that it's very, that leaders have a responsibility to act. You know, we've been talking about diversity for a long, long time. And now is the time for action. Now is the time to, for organization really to, um, to put their, uh, their money where, where their mouth is because, you know, consumers um, are really holding brands into account, employees are holding brands into account. So there's really, really nowhere to um, to hide. And, and in, you know, in a couple of months' time, when we've been um, a year on since um, the, the murder of George Floyd, you know, will organizations step back and say, be able to say, this is what we've achieved in one year. This is how we've changed organizations, but also what it's like for employees to work for us. Uh, I a couple of interesting points. Um, for the record, before we got started today, because you mentioned you know pronouncing a name right, I actually asked Lucille the right way to say her name. That's right. Because I didn't want to you know um, embarrass her or insult her by not saying it right. You know, so I, for the record, I did ask. You know, for for that to make sure it's right. Second, you mentioned the uh, taking credit for other people. I, I've been in that situation as well did work on a presentation, you know, a, a paper, and it was being presented by a vice president and they put their name on it. And mm. I complained and said, wait a minute, no, I did all the work. You yeah. know, I did all the slides, I did all the writing, you know, and you're plugging your name on it. Uh, I said, that's not right. You know, so um, I actually got my name added to it, presented by so-and-so um, uh, pr uh, presentation documented by, and then I had my name added to it at least. And I was like, well, good, yeah, you, you're going to be talking about what I, I said, so, you know, that's not good, <laughs> you know. And you also talked about, um, you know, a, a year after George Floyd, you know, organizations being able to say, here's how we've um, changed. How do you go about measuring that change? Because mm. that, yes. that jumped into my mind as soon as you said, it, it's like, well, how do we measure that? 
Mm, yeah, and, and there are several ways through which you can measure progress. Um, and you might think that diversity and inclusion is quite fluffy. How do you measure it? But actually, <laughs> you, can, you can both measure it through um, quantitative and qualitative measures. So uh, qualitative measures, you can do an employee survey. Are people, do people, um, have they witnessed um, any um, sexist, homophobic, um, racist remarks and all form of, of phobia in, in the workplace? Do there is diversity valued within their teams? Do they feel like um, they can be themselves? They can bring their whole self to work? So that's a way of getting that quality feedback. How are people feeling? Um, and the quality feedback is, um, or, or measurements is really interesting because it can be, you know, measuring, do you have um, uh, an LGBT pay gap, a disability pay gap, a LGBT, uh, ethnicity, gender pay gap, you can look at the, um, you know, are you hiring more of a certain characteristics than another? You can look at the level of promotions, um, but you can also look at how long employees are staying. You know, are mm -hmm. um, uh, employees from a certain characteristic staying longer in the organization? Is it taking them uh, longer to be promoted? Um, and you can also do comparison, you know, can you compare, um, uh, results, whether they are financial results of, of teams that are diverse to um, teams that are homogeneous. So they are very creative ways through which we can have tang measure tangible results on uh, diversity and inclusion progress. Now, uh, the other part I, I want to ask is how do you get, uh, how, how do you um, recruit, right, is the word I was looking for, recruit a div um, DNI you know, talent, different talent, you know, and not taking into account your unconscious bias, you know, uh, how do you get uh, diverse individuals into your organization? Yeah, and, and that's where- some, And some want people, to be in your organization. That's right, that's right. And I suppose that's where um, some organizations, some individuals become quite defensive. You know, that's where the discussion around quotas comes in or targets. So, you know, quotas are, um, you know, not necessarily the right thing because you might uh, build up resentment in, in your organization, but targets, on the other hand, you really, through targets, have a chance to build um, a plan in place um, to make sure that you you achieve those targets, that you you know, what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. In terms of recruiting, making sure that you have the right individuals, what you want to do is not... Um, you know, taking away uh, a, a slice of the pie. You want to make the pie bigger. You want to widen the gates to make sure that you have the, the best talent out there, but also that your recruitment process allows for everyone to show their talent, to show that they are the best person for the job. So, you know, uh, what's the recruitment process like? Are you relying too much on referrals? You know, hmm. are you looking at saying, oh, I don't think this person will fit in in here, which is quite, can be quite dangerous because you're looking at a, um, you're not looking at a, uh, an objective assessment, you're looking at a subjective perception once again. Um, so it can be anything from ensuring that your interview panel is diverse, looking at, do you have a diverse shortlist? What's your website saying about your, your benefits and your culture? Um, Does it even look like a, a diverse environment? That's right, that's right. Um, but also the interesting thing is that you can spend a lot of money on your recruitment activities, but if you get people in and then they realize that the culture is toxic, they won't stay. Mm. Um, so, so that's why, you know, it goes really hand in hand. You know, you want to make sure that you've got your, um, you're focusing on recruitment um, by having objective measures, uh, by making sure you've got that, that diverse panels, that, you know, there are role models that you can showcase, um, but also that once, people are in the organization, do they believe that they can progress? Do they believe that um, they'll be able to uh, bring their whole self to work, but also you know, work to the best of their ability? So, so that's why you can't have the recruitment without that culture element. Well, believe it or not, time flies. We only have two it and a really half does. minutes left. Do you want to take a minute and a half with any uh, final thoughts and comments, uh, things that maybe we didn't touch on you'd like to uh, bring forward for? Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to to recap a few things um, that that to me are very um, very important when you're looking at becoming a, an ally. Um, it's first and foremost um, educate yourself 
uh, and believe in, in the stories that the lived experiences of people then you need to be ready to to go outside of your comfort zone you you need to be ready to um to have it wrong but what will you do to to address what you've had wrong um are you able to challenge other people as well to use the, the privilege that you might have which again can be time can be financial resources can be positions and then you know act on it which is the most important are you every day doing a single actions that is either around educating yourself or making a tangible difference to um, to someone else's life. And not the, the self congratulatory pat on the back, you know, that's right. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the appearance I'm doing something, but really I'm not doing anything of material worth. Am I doing it for myself, you know, to make myself feel good to have this idea of I'm being the savior when actually you should amplify other people's voices and not speaking on, on their behalf, which is, I find quite interesting. We, we still have one minute. Can you take 30 seconds? If I want to become more diverse in my own behavior, how do I get started right away? How can I get started right away? Yeah, I would um, definitely <laughs> uh, take the implicit bias test. Um, they are really great uh, resources on LinkedIn. I think they've made their suite of uh, DNI training available to watch for free to everyone. So watch an unconscious bias training session, um, look at blogs around from, from, from diverse individuals, what it's like to, um, to have a mental health issue, a disability and, and work. Uh, and put people first, you know, remind yourself that you are dealing with individuals and each of them will have, because of their intersectionality, a different experience outlook of life and something that um, that they can teach you. Well, I, I for the last 10, 15 years <laughs> or so, I believe you know every conversation you have with someone, you should be able to walk away learning something new. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I've certainly learned a lot today. You know, oh, a, a lot of you know, and I, I've really enjoyed this talk, and I hope a lot of people listening and watching really take a lot from it because it was fantastic talking with you, Lucille. Thank you very much for sharing your time. Great, thank you for, for the opportunity. And I feel like we've, we've covered um, a lot today. So it yeah. was really great to, to be part of, of this show. Well, thank you once again. Congratulations for your talk at BCI Virtual World. And uh, hopefully we'll run into you again um, sure. at another conference or maybe even back on the show at some point. And to everybody else out there, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.